able to get that 1.21 billion or somewhere close to it, will these rate increases somehow be offset or are these happening no matter what? So Yunji, I don't have a penny yet <laughs> uh, from the federal government, from the U uh, U.S. Navy, uh, but if we get substantial amounts of money uh, coming in and we actually have that commitment uh, in front of us, then we'll, we'll take a look at the water rates and see what it should be going forward, adjusting for the new flow of money into the into our, our uh, accounts. And forgive me if, uh, for my ignorance in the overall accounting and how things are budgeted, but <clears throat> when you factor in all that has happened with Red Hill and the amount of time, effort, and resources that you folks have had to pour in from the department, uh, that must not have been something that was initially budgeted within your department. So uh, how is that? Is this almost like a reimbursement of some of the funds that you guys have had to front during this time of having to combat with Red Hill? Uh, some of it will be reimbursement. I think I forgot to ask the answer the last part of your last question to you is, are the rate increases driven by Red Hill, the issues of Red Hill? And the answer is no, they're not. When we look at our CIP, which the impacts are mostly on our CIP uh, and less on our operating budget, only about our, in our six-year CIP that we project to be funded through these rates uh, is about $1.26 billion. Of that $1.26 billion, the Red Hill-related costs are about 6%, or about $76 million or seven, seventy-seven million. So about a small percentage are, can be attributed to Red Hill. But the rest of it is just the challenges we face to operate a island-wide water system serving over a million people every day with safe drinking water. We have to produce 145 million gallons a day. And all that infrastructure, all it takes to operate this water system, we this year are going to need about $276 million in revenue uh, every year. And that will increase over, over time because of increasing costs. Wow. Uh, let's talk a little bit about replacing the resource that has been lost, at least for now, with the lava shaft. I know that um, you've been out exploring other areas. How fruitful have that, has that search been, and, and how far away are you, do you think, from finding a new source that can replace that one? I think we're many years uh, uh, away from that. We looked at eight potential locations because we selected sites that we already owned land uh, that's within an existing facility. Uh, and uh, that means it's also close to the water system. So pumping it out of the underground aquifer can go right into the pipes or tanks and, and to supply our community. Out of the eight sites, only two turned out to be feasible or viable. And we're proceeding to drill the exploratory wells for those, those two locations, one in IA and the other in the Newtown area. So I think it points toward the challenges of developing replacement wells. It will be a long process and we will have to look at many different sites. And with that, knowing that that also is going to come at a cost of, of just constantly having to find this uh, new source, is that something that is also included within some of the money that you're asking from the federal government? Uh, uh, yeah, like the uh, 1.26, uh, 1.21 billion includes uh, three sources. You know, the biggest being Halava Shaft, uh, equivalent to Halava Shaft, and two well stations equivalent to IL and Halava wells. We are also looking at other wells in the meantime because we had projected that the Honolulu area, the water demand would grow over time. And also the Eva area, that whole Eva Plain Kapolei is growing, a growing community, uh, and some parts of central Oahu that we're gonna need to develop more source capacity. So in the meantime, we're also pursuing new wells to help supply water for those communities. Let's go back to the fuel itself, and you, we know we talked a little bit about cleanup and remediation. But do we know where that fuel is right now? I think that's the that's the that's the one point two one billion dollar <laughs> question. Nobody really knows uh, because there isn't enough. Uh, for example, monitor wells or test wells drilled all the way down until you hit the aquifer below, and to be able to understand the geology and also what you're finding in terms of fuel contaminants in the groundwater. There's not enough. Uh, really, only a part of Halava Valley has been characterized. The side closest to the Red Hill facility. The military, the Navy is starting to drill at other locations, and we applaud that. Uh, but there is much more effort needed to expand our knowledge and understanding. And if, if and when you find that, given how deep it sounds like in the system it is, is there a way to actually recapture any of that and, and, and you know, try to try to save 
the, the aquifer overall. I mean, what the concern, of course, is that, that that keeps going deeper and deeper and contaminates more of our of our water supply. Yeah, that, that's a question we don't know the answer to, Yunji. Uh, but it's really important that we don't uh, ease up on that effort, that we continue to push, uh, push hard uh, with the support of our regulators, the EPA and the Department of Health, on holding the military accountable to continue the investigation because we are actually uh, doing work that will be to the benefit of future generations. Uh, because this, when you have fuel in the environment like that, uh, like because of Red Hill and, and the latest estimate is now close to 2 million gallons, it's not going to disappear overnight. It's going to persist out there and the question is what's happening, where is it moving, what, uh, what can be done to try to clean it up. 